and welcome to the Andy Piazza Show. I'm Dave Hilbert, IPFW Sports Information Director. And yeah, you guys had a, a split a couple of games last week. Started off with a tough loss uh, over at Findlay uh, in a non-conference game on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, we scheduled that game uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. And we wanted a, a tough non-conference opponent in February because of the fact that uh, the kids get a little lack of days ago when you play a non-conference opponent in the middle of your conference season. And when you're playing your traveling partner, Ashland's our traveling partner for conference games, we would only have that game on Saturday during the week. And the worst thing in the world is playing uh, one game a week in February, having that big split. I think Purdue is involved with that right now. They have an eight-day layoff between conference games. So we had an out-conference game, the opportunity to play there. And Finley, the only time they could play that game was then. And we, had a two -year, we have a two-year contract with them. They have to come back to our place next year. And they try to tell the kids uh, how good Finley is. I mean, right now they're 20 and five. Last year they were 23 and eight. Have four starters back. They lost in the national tournament in Kansas City in the NAI, NAI Nationals to David Lipscomb, who was number one in the nation last year. They lost him by one. And uh, they they won like 87 percent of their games at home. And it was a packed crowd. That you know the gym was just filled. And uh, we had a nice following too. We had a lot of people go. Our cheerleaders went. And you try to tell the kids that, and, you know, you can use an excuse that, you know, we just played Southern Indiana, we just played Kentucky Wesleyan, we're a little bit drained emotionally, physically, or, you know, our batteries are worn out, whatever you want to say, but that was Saturday. We had, uh, you know, four days off uh, to get, you know, Sunday off, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, now it's Wednesday we're playing at Finley. It's a short drive over there, and Finley just came out and stuck it to us right from the get-go. Uh, to tell you, we were never tied in the game, and we were never ahead in the game. We were always behind by at least one point. And uh, we shot 40% from the floor, had 18 turnovers. Our execution was not very good, and that was because we were a step slow all the time. Uh, it wasn't like we were dogging it, but they weren't up like they were the week before. Uh, they were just flat. And Finley, on the other hand, had eight days off before our game. And they were just chomping at the bit for us is what it was. You know, we were the biggest game on their schedule. And our kids uh, have to do a better job. This is all new to them the last couple of years. You know, we are the hunted instead of the huntee now. We're, whereas before, we were always the ones, the major underdogs going after people. Now we are on top, you know, ranked 18th in the nation. And, and we have teams, you know, gunning, waiting in the wings, gunning for us. And if we're not up for every team and not playing as hard as we can, uh, we're going to get beat because we're, we're, we have talent, but we're not that talented where we can just show up and turn it on and turn it off whenever we want to. Who are some of the, uh, the top individuals uh, for IPFW in that game? <laughs> I struggle to find any. <laughs> Sean Gibson had 26 points, 13 rebounds, and he played pretty good, but he didn't play on, uh, you know, on top of his game like he did the week before, even though his stats the week before against Southern and Weston weren't as high. Um, but that's it. I mean, the rest of the team uh, struggled. is isn't even the word. Uh, we just had very poor performances and uh, not very good efforts. And it was the, the whole team that played. And uh, I, try, I played a lot of different kids just trying to find a, a spark or a match. And we never made a run at them. And there was, uh, you know, I take the blame that I didn't get the kids ready yet. I, I tried my best. I addressed the issue right from the get-go on Monday's practice, how good Finley was. And IPFW's never beaten them, but they didn't want to hear that because they just beaten Wesleyan after losing 18 times to Wesleyan. So, I mean, uh, they listen how well they they hear, I don't know. And, you know, we forget sometimes they're 20 and 21-year-old kids yet. And uh, it was just a matter of Finley wanted it worse than we did. And it came down to the end, and we were still behind by five points, and we had to uh, fall at the end. And that's why we lost by uh, 13. We only scored 71 points. We were averaging 90 points a game. So we were 20 points below our scoring average. They got shot only just over 40 percent. Uh, you came into the game the top five in the country, field goal percentage, 55, 56 percent. Uh, any particular reason for the off shooting, or was it just, just one of those off nights? Uh, probably a combination of uh, we just didn't shoot very well, and our execution was such that we weren't getting as good a shots as we normally do or as crisp a pass as we normally do. I mean, Shane Gibson was 5 of 16 from the floor, and Scott Simmons was 3 of 10 from the floor. And your two kids like that, those are, those are our two shooters in the wing. They're a combination of uh, 8 for 26 from the floor. And Doug Ranke did not, he only scored two points a thing. And uh, Andre Walton, our point guard, has been scoring a lot of points for us lately. 
uh, score two points. I mean, when that happens, all those kids in the same game, I don't know how many teams we're going to beat, really, with our schedule. So after that game, what, uh, what was the mood then preparing for Ashland, a team that you'd already beat uh, pretty soundly uh, just a couple weeks earlier? Well, I did something after the game that I don't, I haven't never done before. I had the team in the locker room after the game against Finley, and instead of me addressing issues of performance with the team, what I did was I had, I had everybody sit down, and we didn't even take our uniforms off or anything like that. And I just asked each one of them to share with me how they're feeling, share with me and the team what just happened. You know, why did this happen? You know, how do you feel we play? How do you feel about what happened just now? And a lot of people just spilled their guts and said a lot of things. They admitted they weren't ready. They admitted they were flat during warm-ups, uh, that they didn't take them lightly, but they didn't get up like they did last week. Uh, they admitted, they all admitted they didn't play hard. Uh, besides not playing well, we just didn't play hard. Uh, the effort wasn't there. Um, you know, a non-conference game. You know, they had, they didn't make excuses, but they, they shared with me how they felt and the reasons they felt that. We didn't get home to quarter one, even though it was only an hour and a half trip, because uh, we stopped at eight after the, after the, you know, we showered after the meeting and then uh, stopped at eight. And came down to, it's a seven game mini tournament left. Seven conference games left, and if we win them all, we're in the tournament. If we go six and one, who knows? If we win them all and, and the combination of things happen and Wesleyan wins all theirs and Southern wins all theirs except the last game of the year they lose to Wesleyan as a three-way tie, we go as the automatic bid because in the tiebreaker, head-to-head, uh, -head, we're even with all of them, but uh, we've, we would have had beaten Kentucky State twice, so we go as the automatic bid. You know, I just gave them all the scenario, everything that's on the line, everything that could happen, the combinations. And they came to the realization that we're in the driver's seat as far as we determine our own destiny. We determine, if we go to the tournament, we determine a little bit uh, where we're seated in it, things like that. So uh, going home to play Ashton, it was, it's nice going home. And, you know, we had beaten them by a lot of points, but we got a big-time wake-up call on Wednesday. And as you see, the Ashton game, our kids just played their, their hearts out. They just played as hard as they possibly could. And, and uh, sometimes it wasn't pretty, but they, we did play hard. We shot better. And, and we needed that confidence level to come back up. We needed to really get after somebody, which the kids did. Now, how, uh, getting back to the Finley game for a second, how would you compare that loss to the, the loss at Lewis? I know you went into the game with Lewis. Lewis now, Lewis had a, had a poor record. I think they were 2-13. and 13. Finley, on the other hand, uh, I think a lot of people are surprised that you lost only because some people familiar with the program and never heard of Finley and didn't realize that they were a team that was that was that, that good. They were 20 and five, uh, NAI powerhouse. Yeah, Finley beat Bowling Green at Bowling Green last year by 13. Bowling Green Division won the Mid American Conference, 20 miles north of Finley. So uh, it's a situation where you know I knew how good they were. Um, you try to explain to your kids how good they are, but if you have a lot of people bending the kids' ear about, you know, who is Finley and this and that, you know, it, it has an effect on how hard they're going to play. But the Lewis game, we came off, same thing happened. We beat Kentucky State at home in a tough, tough physical game, emotional game, and we went to Lewis on a Thursday night, and there was nobody in the gym. It's like a tomb over there, but, you know, and they were 2-13, and 13. but again, it when we went to Finley, the place is packed. They're 20 and 5. Um, they have very good players. We know some of our kids know some of their kids. We recruited one of their players that they have. So it's a situation where it's not the same as Lewis, yet Lewis should be very important because it's a conference game. So, well, Dave, when you figure out these kids and what makes them click, you let me know because <laughs> I'll win the national championship after national championship and then I'll be a millionaire and we'll all retire happily ever after. But um, you know, Sean Gibson tells me all the time, he said, you'd be a millionaire, you'd, you'd never lose if you figured out wh how, you know, why do kids fluctuate on their emotional levels all the time. And, and uh, the big boys don't even do it. I mean, Georgia Tech beats Duke, turns around like, and loses the College of Charleston. I mean, Kansas gets number one, loses Long Beach State, I mean, at home by 16. And it happens all over the place. I mean, Duke right now, I mean, is, has four or five losses. I mean. And they're supposed to be, you know, their number one and the, all this talent back from last year's national championship team. But who knows? Why did uh, 
the referee makes the, the call at the end of the regulation in the Penn State game. Indiana loses at Penn State, a team that they beat by 55 points or something the first time around. How does that happen? Uh, you saw it in the Super Bowl. I mean, it's just that's that's why we, that's why we lace them up all the time. We don't just write in the scores and call them back. That's why you play the game. But now it's the point though. It doesn't matter who we play in the conference. The record, where it is. I mean, if we don't play hard the entire time now, then there's something wrong with the kids. What effect uh, do you think that game will have, the Findlay loss, uh, on your ranking as opposed to the Lewis game, knowing that, as I said earlier, Lewis was a Division II conference team but had a poor record. Findlay, an NAIA team, usually lost to a, just an NAIA team hurts, but they're not just an NAIA team. They're, they're right. one of the better teams in, the, in that association. Our, with, our, with our regional people, who knows? Um, you and I talk about it every week when the rankings come out. I don't think it's going to affect us because they're a very good program. They're 20 and 5. Uh, right now they're 25 when the regional poll comes out, the national poll. We were only ranked 18th. I don't know if we're going to go up or down at all, truthfully, because there's nobody else in the region. We're going to stay third in the region. Nobody's going to move. Uh, Northern Michigan's not going to move up on us. I mean, if they do, it's an atrocity because they, I mean, they lost again last week and they have six losses. And uh, we have four. and. You know, two of them to Southern Indiana and Wesleyan at the buzzer on the road, and Lewis on the road, and and uh, Finley on the road. All four of them are road game losses. Also, uh, I think the wins over Southern Indiana, Kentucky, Wesleyan stabilize a lot of our. Uh, I don't know what the word is that that uh, you know the recognition that we have right now is because of those win wins, and we you know won them decisively. So it's going to be a point where. Um, we just have to take care of business the last three weeks and, and the polls will be okay at that point. Okay, well we're going to take a break and when we come back we'll take a look at uh, last week's Ashland highlights and then take a look ahead of this week's games. of top-ranked men's volleyball this weekend at IPFW. Tickets available at all Ticketmaster locations or call 481-6643. Hey, welcome back to the Andy Piazza Show. Uh, we're going to take a look at some highlights from the Ashland game here in a second. Uh, who were some of the top players for you in that game? You had a lot of players in double figures. You know, Scott Simmons was your, your high score with 22. Uh, it was a career high uh, in terms of points for him. Uh, I think Andre Walton played ver very well. He had 13 points and 13 assists. Uh, Doug Ranke did not score a whole lot for us. I think he only scored two points mm -hmm. in the game. But he had a career high seven assists and could have had three more. I mean, he kicked him out to wide open people who missed shots. But um, Doug did not score, and you know they were taking a lot of things away from him. Here's the uh, tape of the Ashland game. Uh, Sean Gibson getting a defensive rebound like he normally does, and kicking out to Russ Marsicker, point guard, back to Shane, to Doug. And he just finds people. That's Andy Liebert hitting a three in the corner. Doug did that because weak side help came across and, and took away his layup attempt, and, and uh, they were going to be they were starting a double team in there, and. I do agree with philosophies of some coaches like Rick Pitino at Kentucky. We, we shoot threes, but not like as many as they do. But you go inside to go outside. We go inside. If they double up on us, we go back out and shoot the threes. If they don't double up on us, then our postmen are going one-on-one -on -one inside. And you have senior postmen, Sean Gibson and Doug Ranke, and, and it's hard to stop those kids consistently on a one-on-one -on -one basis. <clears throat> I thought our kids played well as a team against Ashland defensively. We just got after people. Um, a lot of pressure on the ball. 
There's Sean getting a steal because of the defensive pressure and a dunk at the other end. And he did that because of the defensive pressure that Tom Patterson was putting on the wing. And we, st we were stepping up in passing lanes, and we weren't allowing very easy passes. We were cutting the lead on all of our, all the players. That means we were denying any kind of entry pass, the ball being from the perimeter towards the basket, towards the baseline. And we, j we worked on that um, a little bit Thursday and Friday. We have been working on it a lot lately. We worked on a lot in practice yesterday, a lot of individual defense. There's Andre Walton, our point guard, our captain, bringing it up. We're running a secondary break, throw it inside to go outside. Doug Ranke, Shane threw it inside. They double down. As soon as the defender turns his head, it goes for the double down. We throw it back out. And we just do that a lot. The kids look for themselves. We drill that and practice it. And it's kind of a natural thing to do. We do, we do that before we go into our sets. And uh, we run a primary break and then a secondary break. And then we do, and we'll go inside if we can. If not, we'll just kick it back out. We'll, we'll run a set offense. And we have different sets against different you know, if man-to-man -man, uh, defense, which we face primarily, we just run a, a lot of different sets. And wherever their weaknesses are, we tend to go towards them right away. Um, Sean Gibson got hurt in the game, too. He, he went in the game with a bad back. He didn't even practice Friday. That's Tom Patterson getting a rebound. He's, he's been playing well in practice just the uh, last couple of days, so we played a little more. Scott Simmons just draining a three with the Ashton kid right in his face. And, uh, Andre getting the assist on that. The more you run the ball up, uh, the slower the defense seems to get as the game wears on. And uh, especially a team that doesn't play a lot of kids or plays too many kids and they don't get adjusted, they don't find their men that well. They substitute too much. And we try to we try to get the ball up court as quickly as possible without making a turnover, obviously, and then take the best shot we can er, in early offense. But if it doesn't, it's not there. We we'll just uh, go from. Go from there in our sets. Russ Marstick, Sean stepping up. With the lob pass, good help side by Sean, and we're off to the races. Uh, Dre just taking it all the way and keeping it. We told him to be more selfish. Uh, teams were not stopping him. Uh, he was stopping himself. He'd pull up from the perimeter and make the pass. And he, the ball was never really stopped. Nobody came out really pressure him. So we told him to force the issue a little more. Just keep going down the lane until somebody actually steps up and guards you because then a postman on the block's going to be open right away or just kick it off for threes in the corner. He just does a great job for us, and he's pretty strong with the ball. Um, good shot of our bench. Defensive, this is Andre just getting after people. Getting his own rebound at 5'8", throwing the ball all the way down to Gibson who was guarding a perimeter person at that time and on a defensive rebound released. And it's nice when you've got a 6-7 who's your leading rebounder, all-time leading rebounder school's history, that on the perimeter he can see that our point guard is 5 8 has got the defensive rebound so he can release. So that's just Sean Gibson. He's just a pretty intelligent kid and pretty intelligent floor leader out there, too. I was saying that earlier that Sean hurt his back Wednesday's game. He got taken down in Finley pretty hard and it spasmed him a little bit after practice Thursday. So fr Friday he didn't practice at all. And, He's pretty stiff Saturday, and he played somewhat gingerly and then got loose as the game went on. But then he caught an elbow uh, right across the, the top of the eye um, in the second half. He, there's about 10 minutes to go in that game. And uh, had to get 15 stitches put in it. So he didn't play as, many, as much as we liked. Here's Doug Ranke looking inside. Andre Watt going right down the lane, back cut because he was denied the ball back out, and Doug does a nice job. As a senior, see, he never did that as a freshman or a sophomore, and he's just more co confident with the ball and ball handling. They don't put a lot of pressure on him, and he's 6'9 with long arms, and he can see over the top of a lot of people. And he knows the system so well now, he knows if he gets double teamed where it's from, who's possibly open. He doesn't make the perfect pass all the time, but he, he's knowledgeable about that. And he tries to get the ball to the open person. He's a very unselfish individual, and sometimes too unselfish. We need him to look to score more. Here's Sean Gibson again, getting a defense rebound, kicking out to Andre Walton. And again, they're not set. We hit the three, and I think Scott got fouled in that play, too. It's a four-point play. Four-point play, because he hit the three-point jump shot and was fouled on the jump shot and uh, shoots free throws. Because, uh, shoot, we'll shoot one free throw after that. 
And again, that's because we just get it down quickly. The kids have the green light. They know most, for the most part, they know it's a good shot and a bad shot, and we know who the shooters are, and they go to their spots. And obviously, it, it works because we had 34 field goals and we had 24 assists on 34 field goals. And then I compound that with the fact we shot 56% from the floor, and that's where we're shooting for the year: 54, 55, 56 percent as a team. And you're right; we're in the top five field goal percentage. Every week, I think last week the NCAA news, it's one week in arrears, had a second. Uh, so kids are doing a good job, and we just need to take care of business this week uh, at Kentucky State and at Bellarmine. We're on the road, uh, and then we get to come home for our last home stand next week, uh, the 25th and 27th. We play St. Joe and Lewis. And St. Joe's going to be a war, and Lewis is going to be something else, too, because of the fact that we lost their place since our senior night. We have eight seniors in our last home game. Now this week uh, you go on the road again, Kentucky, or I shouldn't say again, it's kind of been a while since you've been on the road, at least for a GLVC trip. Uh, you got Kentucky State Thursday, Bellarmine uh, Saturday. Uh, Bellarmine the last time had a fairly easy time with, game was never really close, won by about 27. Kentucky State was, was back and forth, uh, you ended up winning by about 5. 83-78. Uh, 83-78, right. it's a tough game. Uh, one thing interesting, they shot better, Kentucky State did from three-point range, they had nine or ten three-pointers, shot about almost 40%. Uh, overall, their field goal percentage was only about 35, 36. Yeah, they got tired second half and uh, wore down a little bit. They did shoot awfully, awfully well the first half from threes, and they just got tired legs. And uh, we need to do a good job of pressuring them constantly the first half so they don't go off on us like they did. We need to also do a good job offensively as executing to make them chase us. Kentucky State is, gonna, is dangerous in the fact that they have very good athletes and they're streak shooters. Uh, they are either going to be on, on, red hot, or they're going to be horrible. And that's what happened against us. They were very good the first half and very poor the second half shooting-wise. Some of that's defensive pressure, some of, some of that's shot, shot selection, some of that's just fatigue. The thing about the fact that Kentucky State's also dangerous is they're 14-8 and eight now, and they have five conference losses. So realistic, not mathematically, they're still in the hunt, but realistically they're out of it. With five conference losses, they're out of the, uh, the for the league championship, um, unless everybody else just falls. Because you know, Southern Indiana has two league losses. We have three. Wesleyan has three. Uh, St. Joe has four. Kentucky State now has five and eight losses overall. So they have no chance of winning 20 games now because we only play 27 this year with the reduction this year by the NCAA. So they have no postseason uh, hopes at all. So they could be playing loosey goosey with. Uh, I say that being that they have nothing to lose and everything to gain and just play for the, for the fun of playing and with no pressure. And we're, on the other hand, have all the pressure on us because every game is a must win. We were fortunate to beat them last year down there uh, by a good margin. And their crowd will not be very big now that they're losing, too. And so that won't be a factor either. So, uh, again, if we play hard and, and play uh, smart on offense, we'll be in good shape. And they're only playing like seven kids, and I noticed Kentucky State the last couple of weeks. They just came off two big losses at West and at Southern. And they lost Transylvania, so they lost three games last week. And uh, so they're, they're either going to quit or they're just going to show up and go through the motions or they're going to come out and, and uh, get after us because they have nothing to lose. Now, the last time you guys played them, it was kind of a heated game. I know the uh, teams made a special point of going to different locker rooms after the game. I know you and their coach exchanged words at one point during the game. Do you expect any of those... Uh, Feelings to carry no, over to this game? No, Bill Graham and I are, are cohorts in the business, and we're friends in the summer. We spend time together when we're at camps. I just, uh, he, did, he did a couple things on the bench after one of our kids got hurt that I didn't appreciate, and I just let him know that. And he said something back to me, and I didn't even hear what he said, and that was the end of it. Uh, after the game, he shook, we shook hands. You know, that Michael Grant, the assistant, and I have known each other for years and shook hands. There was no problem at all. It's just the heated moment. You know, he wants to, he's a competitor. He wants to win. I want to win. His kids play hard. Our kids play hard. And, and at that point, we're, you know, everything was on the line. We are going for it. And um, we just went down to the locker room, uh, down the other stairwell, because sometimes we have a heated physical game. You know, in frustration, sometimes a losing team might uh, say something they don't mean. And you know why? You know we prevent altercations that way. That's all. It just uh, anytime there's a physical game where kids are really just getting after, uh, you know they do a lot of jawing and, and talking, and, and our kids respond sometimes, and we don't want that. So we just 
preventive maintenance is all it is. Okay, well, I'd like to wish the team good luck uh, this week. I'd like to remind everyone the team will be out of town this week. They will be in town next weekend, the 25th and 27th, when they play St. Joe on Thursday, Lewis on Saturday. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. of top-ranked men's volleyball this weekend at IPFW. Tickets available at all Ticketmaster locations or call 481-6643. of top-ranked men's volleyball this weekend at IPFW. Tickets available at all Ticketmaster locations or call 481-6643. close to them, where you're not embarrassing them, putting them on the spot, or questioning their integrity in front of everybody, they're, they're usually pretty good with you. They'll explain to you. Or they might watch for what you're asking for. But if you're just ranting and raving and, and embarrassing them in front of everybody, they're going to tee you up, they're going to tee up your players, or they're not going to give you the time of day. They're just going to ignore you, and that's even worse. Okay. Like to thank you for stopping by again this week. I'd like to remind everybody, uh, IPFW be in, uh, in action at home Wednesday against Huntington College at 7.30, and also in action uh, Saturday night against North Central College, also at 7.30.
Hello and welcome to the Andy Piazza Show. I'm Dave Hilbert, IPFW Sports Information Director. Andy, a couple more wins uh, for you guys last week on the road. Uh, started out with a tough one, uh, overtime game at Kentucky State, first uh, overtime game of the year. Well, Dave, you, you're supposed to say congratulations on two <laughs> wins last week. That's your standard line for the last, uh, I don't know how many months now, it's congratulations on the two wins last <laughs> well, it's week. It's going to be routine now. Routine. <laughs> I will take the routine and, and winning like that, but... Uh, well, yes, we did have two wins at Kentucky State in overtime and at Bellarmine Saturday, and great wins for us and that it keeps us first place in the conference, but we'll get to all that mess in a minute here. I'm going to turn the tables and congratulate you. The viewing audience does not realize this yet because it's not made public, but this is the first time it will be made public. When it's not going to hit the news, you're going to be first heard here on Channel 6 that Dave Hilbert, our sports information director, and my host and co-worker for the last two years and been the host of the Andy Piazza show here for the last two years is leaving us. I can't believe it. We just get him straight now. We just teach him how to be a good SID and he's a great host of the NEP as a show. He finally understands me after two years and finally lets me beat him at golf last summer and now he's taking a new job. Uh, our our PFW's loss is going to be the University of Chicago's gain and University of Chicago is getting Dave Hilbert as their head sports information director at a well, at a 40 percent salary increase. It's hard to blame you a little bit plus getting back to Chicago Dave's originally from Milwaukee and he's a great White Sox fan and the University of Chicago is right on Lake Michigan uh, in Hyde Park area there it's one of the more prestigious academic institutions in the United States and they have football and I understand you can have like 60 hours worth of student help and things like that so they're giving you the whole package is what it is so we made them great and, all, and people come along and take them from us is what happens <laughs> And if you could just for a second here uh, share with us a little bit how this came about maybe, Dave, and uh, how it's a uh, stepping stone uh, professionally for you, if you could just share with the viewing audience, please. Uh, well, I know I caught you off guard. <laughs> yeah, you just did. share with us a little bit the positives, you know, uh, you know, your friends and ties with the Chicago area and the kind of institution you're going to and the kind of the basketball coach that you're going to work for there as a friend of mine, Pat Cunningham, and, uh, and different things like that. <laughs> yeah, you did kind of kind of catch me off guard a little bit. Well, instead of talking about Chicago, I'll talk about uh, some things I like working about here. I miss uh, working the program here. I know your your program, women's program. I'll see. You're be, not uh, going to get paid here. Right you're direction. only getting paid for 30 more days here, whether you say good <laughs> things or not. So go ahead, Dave. Share with us. <laughs> share with us some of your thoughts the last two years here. And uh, uh, well, programs made a big change, especially uh, your program. Time I've been here. Uh, when I got here, you guys were well. You you had winning seasons every year, but. Uh, Really hadn't been at the 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 national the top of the, the nation top of the heap. You guys fourth in the country this year. I was good to see uh, the other programs here. I mean, obviously men's volleyball is one of the best in the country. The women's basketball team in a tournament last year. So uh, there'll be a lot of things I'll miss miss around here. But uh, I will be here uh, for you guys. I'm waiting to waiting to get my ring. So if you guys, you guys go to Springfield, I want my ring. Right Dave's right last official day here on <laughs> campus is March 19th. Um, he's going to see us through the basketball season, and if we get an NCAA bid, the regionals are the 12th and 13th of March, and if we're fortunate enough to win the regionals, which means we play at the Elite Eight in Springfield, Massachusetts, I think the dates are March 25th, 26th, 27th. So Dave's supposed to be done on the 19th, but he's going to jump back on the bandwagon, get on the <laughs> airplane, go with us to Springfield, you know, and, and lap up all the luxury in the Marriott there and the hoopla on the national title and the banquet cha the championship era are there and and go to the hall of fame all those things and then if we're fortunate enough to get to that far he's going to come back on the plane jump on another plane and head for chicago the very next morning to <laughs> work but guys? we have st stipulation in his contract that he has to stay with <laughs> us to the end of the men's basketball season go ahead dave i didn't mean to interrupt you <laughs> nah, no problem <laughs> but uh, university of chicago excited about the move big yeah, move for you move. Upgrade so professionally as far as uh, more responsibilities, bigger budget, bigger work staff, obviously a bigger salary. Uh, men's football you're going to have, obviously. Share us a little bit about the yeah, situation. It's a good program over there. Like I said, they're Division three, but they compete uh, in the University Athletic Association with other top Division three. And a lot not of people do not programs, understand that. Academic could, programs. Yeah, could you share with us the, like, the places that you will travel to with the football and basketball team, for example, the cities and the colleges? Schools like Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, uh, Brandeis in Boston, Emory in Atlanta, NYU. So they. New York University, the there's one yeah, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, uh, Carnegie Mellon. In Case Western in Cleveland. In Cleveland. And Washington. In so it's a national, national schedule. Yeah, they don't compete necessarily for. Well, I shouldn't say they don't compete nationally, but they compete within their own league is their, their primary goal. 
University of Chicago, for the people that don't know, is like a uh, uh, it's like an Ivy League school, only it's not on the East Coast. Yeah, if it were located in the East Coast, then it probably would be. Like you have to have a 1300 AC <laughs> SAT just to get the. Like, they, they, they laughed at, uh, at our uh, high school applications. So yours <laughs> or mine? Both of ours, huh? <laughs> probably lumping us in together. <laughs> well, congratulations. Uh, it's your, uh, like I said, University of Chicago's gain and IPFW's loss. and. Uh, you've just done a great job here, and if people that don't understand, the Sports Information Director is responsible for any kind of uh, publicity or information that's released about the athletic department to the public, whether it be print media, uh, TV, or uh, like our media guys last year, Dave's media guide won the uh, national, uh, the men's basketball, women's basketball combination media guide won the uh, media guide of the year award nationally. That's 200, and for NCAA Division II, that's 250 some schools. And the cover uh, last year with Lisa Miller and Sean Gibson on the, on the front shooting at a, at a hoop at a barn out uh, in a rural area of Fort Wayne um, won, the, won the cover guide of the year. And the year before that, I think we were runner-up. Mm -hmm. And the year before that, we won it, didn't we? I think we've won it two of the last three years and we're runner-up one year. So uh, obviously it's easy to see why the University of Chicago would snatch up Dave. And, and they only brought three people in for the... Uh, final interview and two of them were division one big time guys and uh, they realized that Dave was the, the perfect situation and they spoiled him by giving him a 40 percent salary increase and and uh, all I know is when I go to the Cubs games now I got some place to uh, some place to stay to shack up. and uh, Hyde Park is right on the shores of Lake Michigan I think you were telling me yesterday you could jump on a bike pedal bike and in five minutes you're at the lake so mm -hmm. it's a just a beautiful area I'm from Michigan originally and I spent a lot of time in Chicago and I realized that so Congratulations, and I'm sorry to see you go. And uh, hopefully, we we'll get together and play some golf uh, this summer when you get, after you get a situation. <laughs> that sounds good. Let's go on a uh, real <laughs> stuff now. Okay, real stuff. So Kentucky State overtime game. Guys uh, beat them earlier at our place. Last year, you beat them pretty handily at their place. I uh, understand you had to hit a couple free throws, three seconds left, uh, just to, f to get into the extra period. Yeah, Kentucky State uh, had lost the previous week at Southern Indiana and at Westland, Kentucky Westland. So they're backs were to the wall, so to, so to speak. It was a must, must, must win for them. Obviously, it was a must win for us, but they had to win because they already had five losses in the league. And a situation where if they wanted to get in the tournament, they had to beat, they had to win all the last five games. And they played very well. We played hard, but the first half, for the first time in the year, our kids played um, uptight. They played worried, concerned. Uh, they didn't play free-flowing. They didn't, they put forth the effort, but a little bit offensively was they're trying not to make mistakes. And sometimes when you try too hard and you want to win too bad, you, you tend to play too uh, tentative or the timing's off or whatever the situation is. So at halftime, we addressed the fact that, hey, that's not us. You know, we don't get uptight just because we're going for the conference championship <laughs> and the NCAA tournament. I mean, sure, we all know that, but we're not going to put that much pressure on ourselves. In the second half, we did a better job executing. We're more patient and still behind. Um, fortunately, Sean Gibson, we ran a special for him when we were down two, and uh, he got hammered on a layup attempt. They had to follow him because he was going to score with three seconds to go. Good move on their part. And fortunately, the first free throw he shot hit the rim about, really hit the rim three or four times in the backboard once. But people were saying hit the rim seven or eight times. <laughs> and you know how the legend glo exactly grows as it goes on. <laughs> and he made both those. In the overtime period, we score right away. And they go down and they score 7-0 run on us. Great coaching, I know. But in two and a half <laughs> minutes in, left in the overtime period, we're down five. So uh, again, we come back, we execute down the stretch. And they have the ball with uh, down one. Uh, with 17 seconds to go, and they worked. They called a timeout, and they worked for a good shot, and never got a shot. Scott Simmons deflected a pass out of the post because Gibson had the Sean had the Cedric Fuller smothered inside and tipped it, and uh, was able to recover it and was fouled and made one of the free throws. We ended up winning by two in overtime. Just a, you know, a gr obviously a great win for us. Everyone's a great win now, whether you win by two in overtime or by 30 in regulation. Every win now is a, a great win when you're going for the tournament here. And Saturday, like you said, Bellarmine is always tough. And again, we found ourselves at halftime down six, like at Kentucky State. And some of it is the fact that uh, Bellarmine's playing at home. They have pride. Uh, they have a chance to knock off one of the big teams. And they played really, really well. Really well. And they shot very well the first half. They shot 60% for the floor. Uh, Quinn Drake, the one of their guards, was four for four from threes. And, and uh, just did a nice job. And second half, we just clawed back a little bit, clawed back, and then they went on spur. We're down eight with 
eight minutes to go. And uh, about the last seven minutes, we played about as well as we can play. I don't know. I mean, you love to see it as a coach. The fact is that your seniors just took over. Uh, Scott Simmons did a great job uh, coming off the bench, and Andre Walton, our point guard, and Sean Gibson, our captain, our two caps, just played well. Uh, Pat Murphy played excellent. People understand John Hoster is still out with an injury. One of our postmen, and uh, Doug Ranke was sick all weekend. And he hardly played. He had to play in the overtime and a little bit of the regulation against Kentucky State, but he had to play 17 minutes Saturday because Murph got in foul trouble again. And Pat just played great inside. Just did a nice job at 13.7 rebounds. And just got them in foul trouble with a lot of his post moves. And the last seven minutes, uh, we executed just perfectly at offense and made made a lot of shot, a lot of big shots. Uh, and they ch we changed offenses very well. Defensively, we just put the clamps on the three-point shooters, and and uh, we were up 16 with 43 seconds to go. They made four free throws in the last 43 seconds, so we ended up winning 83-71. So. Uh, anytime you go down south and get two wins, it's just a feather in those kids' cap. It's the first southern sweep we've ever had here in the history of IPFW men's basketball. And it's the first time we've ever beaten Bellarmine at Bellarmine. So, again, we get a lot of firsts, it seems like, every week. Now, uh, did I read the box score correctly in the Kentucky State game? Cedric Fuller did not score? No. I'm trying to think. No, he scored. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just he, he scored a... Because he, I mean, he's been player of the week at least yeah, two or three times got, in the league. And yeah, I think he got like 18 points. Oh, I'm okay. not sure. Yeah, that was incorrect. Okay, I was just curious because I thought <laughs> that would have been kind of yeah. strange. In the Bellarmine game, uh, just two years ago, this is one of the first games I worked here, uh, the roles were kind of reversed. You guys came in, I think, 14 and 10, 15 and 10, really had no shot at the tournament. Beller came, Bellarmine came in ranked, I think, second or yeah, seventh. They were, they were in the top 10 and top 5 in the country. They were between 3rd and 5th in the nation during that time period and I think they were 3rd when we played them and it was the roles reversed and we beat them in overtime here and the very next week uh, Ashland came here, they were number 1 and, and that team was th these the kids we have now only when they were freshmen and sophomores so um, yeah the roles reversed and uh, you know that, the other thing that people don't realize is Louisville is right across the river from New Albany where uh, Shane Gibson, Sean Gibson and and Andrew Liebert are from. They played high school. In fact, their coach came over Thursday at Kentucky State. Our high school coach saw them play. We had a tremendous crowd there because we had all those Southern Indiana people coming over to see us play. Also, John Hostrad, who was hurt, had his whole family come there and cheer us on. So it was a, a semi-home crowd for us there at Bellarmine. Okay. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll uh, take a look ahead at next week's games and also look at the uh, playoff picture. of top-ranked men's volleyball this weekend at IPFW. Tickets available at all Ticketmaster locations or call 481-6643. Well, welcome back to the Andy Piazza Show. Now, this week, uh, last, last weekend of the home season, a uh, couple of tough games. St. Joe, who's been on a, on a tear lately, and then Lewis, who uh, who knocked you guys off back at their place uh, about three weeks ago. Knocked you guys off? <laughs> oh, but how come it's we when we win? It's you guys when we lose. Well, I could, you're halfway to Chicago already in a good job, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, St. Joe's tough. Uh, I think they're the uh, one of the best coach teams in the league. I think Dan Peters just does a great job with them. He was a they were conference tri champs last year, went to the tournament. And he was a uh, conference coach of the year and in his first year in the league, and <clears throat> his kids just play so hard defensively. Um, 
they probably pressure the ball and contest passes better than any team in the league. Uh, their only loss, fortunately for us, their only loss at home uh, is us. Now, we beat them. Uh, we scored on a set play that was special with it. We run a uh, three-point jumper with 10 seconds to go when the score was tied 63 off. Fortunately, we had the ball at the end. And they had to hit a three. And it's harder to hit a three, obviously, with 10 seconds to go than it is a two. And uh, so even if we foul them, they only get two free throws. So they had a wild shot, didn't even come close to making it. So that was their only loss at home. And to tell you how tough the league is, Kentucky Wesleyan is not lost at home. Southern Indiana is not lost at home. We have not lost at home. St. Joe's only lost to us. Kentucky State, the next team in the league, only has two losses at home to us in overtime by two last week and to St. Joe. So it's a situation where it just tells you at, at home everybody's tough. And St. Joe is going to bring a big crowd with them. Uh, we're going to have a big crowd, too, because we have a lot of things going, uh, uh, special ceremonies at halftime academically and, and retiring of a jersey and things like that. Uh, plus, uh, St. Joe has a lot of local kids, both on their, they have, on the women's team, has a lot of local kids. The men's team has one, Mark Scheidler from Belmont. And last year, I think we had, uh, after Christmas, 1,400 people there. Yeah, that was uh, our for biggest home, our biggest home crowd. And it was during the holidays, during the Christmas break. So we're looking uh, as, you know, upwards of close to maybe 2,000 people are going to be there Thursday for a St. Joe game. And when you come down to it, the GOVC notes that you received this week from the Conference Sports Information Director is the, it's the game of the week. It's probably the game of the month. It could be the game of the season when you're talking about it because it's like baseball, you know, playoff fever time. You know, the pennant race is on. And if we win, it, it's a big, it's a huge win for us because of the fact that it gets us the, you know, that's the last team that's in the t top five that we have to play. And being at home should be a great advantage to us. And then we have Lewis, like you said, on Saturday. We lost at their place by three right at the end in the last play of the game. Uh, if our kids are not fired up for that, there's something wrong with them. And it's senior night. It's our last home game. And these two games, I don't think I have to get the kids up at all for. And then if we can get by these two games, the uh, last week of the season, it's, it's easier for 20-year-old kids to focus on what's at hand. We go to Northern Kentucky and to Indianapolis last, game, last week of the season, and this is for uh, the whole thing. See, we're tied with the right now. We're tied. Well, Southern Indiana's 12-3. and three. We're 11-3 and three in the conference. They have one more win, but they've played one more game. Mm -hmm. Their last week of the season, ironically, they play at Kentucky Wesleyan on March 6th, their traveling part. Not a place you want to finish your season. No. So the thing, the key is losses in the league. We have three, they have three, Wesleyan has three, and Saint, or I'm four, and St. Joe has four. So uh, again, St. Joe cannot afford a loss. So they're going to be playing like that on Thursday. So I look for just a war on Thursday. And, and then hopefully get through by Lewis on Saturday. You know, we can't look by Lewis even though their record is, they're pretty good in the league though. I mean, they're like five and nine in the league, but you know, pretty decent, but their overall is not that good. Do you look for another low-scoring game against St. Joe? In the last uh, several times you played them, scores have been in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Last time you played them home, it was in the 50s, 55-51. Yeah, scores deceive. People think we don't shoot well when we play St. Joe. Uh, at St. Joe, that one of the, probably the toughest gym to play in the conference, we were 53% from the floor. You don't take as many shots for two reasons. Number one, they hold the ball a long time. They run a passing game where they really work the shot clock, not to stall, but to get the best shot they can. They try to wear you down. So they take time off. The other thing is uh, they play good defense without fouling. So you don't go to the free throw line a lot. We don't. And on the other hand, they play such good defense that we have to take more time on our set offense. We have to reverse the ball more. We have to set more picks. We have to move without the ball more. So we take more time than we normally do to get the shots that, we're that we normally get. So it's a situation where we get less shots, less free throw attempts, less time with the ball and less ball possessions because offensively they're so patient. So the score uses the indicative of both teams playing very good defense, both teams showing patience because of the good defense, and both teams not fouling that much because um, they're just more disciplined defensively, it seems like, in those kind of games. And it seems like the games that are runaways or where we're behind or whatever, we have to foul a lot more, or we do foul a lot more. So. Uh, I don't think the score will be that high if being at home is any indication that it would help. If we can get the score up in the 70s and 80s, it would be to our advantage because it's more like a running game. But in watching the film last night of our first game against St. Joe, uh, they're not afraid of running it up and, and shooting a quick shot either. So if 
if we can turn them more into a track meet, I think it'd be to our advantage uh, because we play more that way than they do. And we will take better shots off that track meet than they will. So we'll see. They didn't shoot that well again when we put it at their place. In fact, they shot 38% for the game at home. That's not, that's awful to shoot at home. And I'd like to credit some of that with the defense that our kids did play, especially the second half. Now, uh, when you guys go to play Lewis, are you going to make any changes from the last time you played them? Or did they just have, I know they had a couple of guys that just had some career nights. But they had a couple guys with career nights. And <coughs> they made 21 out of 25 free throws as a team. And they're only shooting like 60% uh, normally. And... Uh, they got to go on the road. We're going to make some adjustments on just two of their players, Rich Anger and John Adams. Uh, both all, they are, they're all conference players. We'll make a little bit of adjustment defensively with them, give them a little bit more uh, special attention, turn them a certain way, give some help a certain way on them, and do a better job of pressuring the ball, especially their perimeter people, because uh, they have a freshman point guard. And we'll make sure that more of our shooters get the ball in scoring areas by just running more specials for them. And being at home will be an advantage in that. We, we play good at home, but other teams don't seem to play as well when they come here because, you know, at, uh, as you saw at our Westland game, our crowd's just been unbelievable now. We, you know, we were you know, pretty packed against Kentucky Westland, and, and if we have the crowds that we anticipate this Thursday and Saturday, despite this weather, we're going to have everybody's used to the snow now, so they're going to get out and travel it anyway. And being our last home game Saturday in a senior night, you would hope that we'd have just a, a huge crowd for that. And being that we're not going to play home again unless we're in the regionals, unless we get the bid to host the regionals. So it be the last time to see these kids playing. Now, uh, if you could explain a tiebreaker a little in the GOVC if we were to end up tied uh, with Southern Indiana. Uh, if, if, if IPFW and Southern Indiana are both tied with three losses, if we were to win out and uh, well, the other team is behind us, yeah, how if, that works for us? If it was just Southern and us, if University of Southern Indiana and us, and IPFW, we, if we won all the rest of our games, and they did too, um, we'd both be tied, we'd be co-champs. The automatic bid for the NSA tournament only gets one out of our conference. If that happened, that scenario, then Southern Indiana would go, get the automatic bid in that scenario because they would have beaten Kentucky Wesleyan twice and we split with them, okay? If, there's a, if they lose to Wesleyan and we win all of ours, then it's... Um, a situation where we would go because they go in order of descending order how you did against uh, common opponents from top to bottom and and uh, if we lost a game and Southern lost and and we lost to St. Joe and it's a four-way tie for first which could happen which almost happened last year yeah four four losses they'd go in descending order and at that point uh, Westland, Southern, us and St. Joe would have all split and with each other. And if we go in descending order, we all split all the way down three times. And Kentucky State, only St. Joe and us, uh, or um, it would, would have beaten them twice if St. Joe, if we lose St. Joe and St. Joe mm -hmm. beats Kentucky State. There's all kinds of scenarios like that. It could come out of like that situation that uh, St. Joe could get the automatic bid. I mean, it could get really hairy here at the end. <laughs> And hopefully we don't want that to happen. We want to just take care of business here. So that's why Thursday is very important because we need to beat St. Joe because they're in the hunt for the conference title. We need to give them the fifth loss more than anything else. And believe it or not, if we can do that going in the last game, if we win our next three and going in the last game, I hate to say it, but most of IPFW, in fact, all of IPFW's following and fans and Royal Dons, everybody will actually be rooting for Kentucky Westland, <laughs> that's which scary. I get scary thought, <laughs> to is. beat Southern Indiana. <laughs> And then that would be the greatest thing in the world, to be at Indianapolis and to uh, ha have a win that day and have, uh, you know, end up 23-4 and four and then ha hearing the news that Wesleyan beat uh, Southern Indiana. That way you'd be the conference champ all by yourself and put a banner in the, banner in the Gates Sports Center finally. Now what about the, uh, the regional picture? I know every week we try to come up with a prediction for this poll. We're never, we're usually not even close. But, uh, well, we were third last we week. Move up this week. Last week, Wesleyan was one, Southern was, Indiana was two, we were three, Northern Michigan was four, Wayne State and St. Joe were tied for fifth in the region. St. Joe beats one and two, we win two, Northern Michigan wins two. I can't imagine what they're going to do. <laughs> we, we could move up, we could all stay the same. You'd think St. Joe would move up, but we, only, we moved up from fourth to third 
when we, we beat Wesleyan Southern, they didn't move. Wesleyan got beat by 25 at St. Joe and only beat Lewis by five. I don't know how much movement you have this late. Um, Michigan always is going to have a team in there. They're going to have a team at fourth. Uh, Northern Michigan's 18-6. They're going to have them fourth because Michigan's going to get an automatic bid. And so in the regional poll, they keep a Michigan school, politically they keep a Michigan school fourth, even though St. Joe probably deserves to be fourth. Because at the end, if you don't win, if you keep winning, how do you justify moving somebody out of the top four spots in the region on the last day of the season when you know you've got to get an automatic bid mm -hmm. from the Conference of Michigan, which is sad in a way. But the way it looks right now is that Michigan's only going to get one in. And uh, that's good for us because we'll, we'll get three in that. I just hope we're one of three. Now, last year that was a problem because I think it was what Wayne State was ranked number one in the region all year. But uh, in that league, they determined the, the champion through the postseason tournament, whereas in a GLBC, it's just regular season play. Wayne State lost in the tournament, uh, went to Grand Valley. So Grand Valley got the automatic bid. They still had to take Wayne State since they were ranked one in the region. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, like I said, doesn't look like that's going to happen this year. Yeah, the best thing for us is to keep the Michigan school fourth in the region all the way through March 6th. And uh, the last national poll, I think, is March uh, 2nd. It's the last national poll. They don't have a national poll after that. They have March 2nd, the last national poll. You have the two games left of your season. And the seventh, the bids come out. So the bids in the host site. So it's great, great time to be, <laughs> great time to be involved in this program because uh, you can't ask for a better situation than to be at the last two weeks of the season, the last four games, with all the uh, all the marbles on the table right now. And uh, the, we were the same way last year, and uh, two years before that we were, and two years before that we were. So we're 19 and four now, and uh, people don't understand that. With one more win, that'd be our fourth winning season the last five years and personally for me it'd be seven of my nine years of college coaching counting my three years at junior college and that's just a standard of excellence when you only play 27 games that uh, 20 wins plus is like you know the the elite group and uh, we're just fortunate to be there the last few years okay i'd like to remind everyone uh, ipfw will play its final two home games of the year uh, thursday against st joe and saturday against uh, lewis saturday's game will be senior night uh, both games start at 805 of top-ranked men's volleyball this weekend at IPFW. Tickets available at all Ticketmaster locations or call 
welcome to the uh, Andy Piazza Show. I'm Dave Hilbert, IPFW Sports Information Director. Uh, bonus uh, NCAA Tournament Edition of the Andy Piazza Show this week. And you guys uh, pulled out the big win at Indianapolis, a 62-60 win. Uh, clinched your first ever GLVC title. What, uh, what was going through your mind there in the last, last five, six minutes of that game when oh. Indy took the lead over? Overtime. That's what I was thinking. We had a seven-point lead at half and a very lucky seven-point lead. We only shot 38%, 39% the first half. And here's the end of the game. Here's the last ball possession for Indianapolis that we wanted to show everybody because it was down in Indy. We had a great crowd there. Then went to Shannon Arthur who dumps it inside. Uh, it, the score right now is 60-60, and there were 56 seconds to go when they received the ball, so there's 11 seconds difference between the shot clock and the um, game clock. Arthur gets it. Doug Ranke's not, or Pat Murphy's not going to let him score a layup. We fouled Arthur because he's a 63% free throw shooter. So there's a little bit of strategy involved there. We're going to follow him or Jim Mosier, and we did that in the plays before because Jim Mosier from Woodland's not a very good free throw shooter either. Doug Staley, we were not going to follow because he's an 84% free throw shooter. So doesn't, and we call it timeout right there to uh, basically talk a little strategy, but more importantly, uh, freeze. There's the score, 60-60 with 26 seconds to go, to freeze uh, Shannon Arthur at the free throw line and make him think about it a little bit. So he goes up here, proceeds to throw up a monstrous brick, <laughs> and then what we do on that point is we decide we have two more timeouts. We'll call. One more time out. Let him go sit down and think about it for another 90 seconds, which is not great. You know, the, you know, that's not an ingenious coaching strategy. People have used it before. I've used it many times. And told all five guys to get in line. Told Andre Walden, if this, this baby comes long, you better get it this time. Sure enough, clang again. Andre <laughs> Walton with the ball. 26 seconds when he got the ball. It's about 22 now. We're going to run delay game. We were, they were told if score was tied, we were taking the last shot. And they were not going to get the ball back. If we miss, we go overtime. Uh, we just dribble entry, goes back to Shane, back to Andre. Here we go. Down, we set a double stagger for Sean. They double him up. Andre has to take the shot. Sean in traffic, falling down, hits the rim, falls in. Watch the bench, watch the video. Those are the 1993 GLVC champions. First conference. Look at those kids. They just keep it rolling there. There's a celebration they shake hands and they all get together i think they keep the camera rolling here uh, we shake hands and then we all gather at midcourt and just remind the people what we just accomplished 62 60 was the final score add also on to that the fact that uh and let's just keep the tape rolling there because of the fact that we're going to get together here midcourt and talk about it after we do our congratulations to the other team i guess that's the end of the tape we had more on there, but uh, <laughs> we had the celebration. The kids actually gathered in midcourt, and we got together, and uh, we went up in the stands and actually thanked our fans for everything that they've done. And we had uh, 250, 300 people drive down there for the game, which was just an unbelievable show of uh, loyalty that they would drive down and pay, you know, buy their own tickets to get into the game to see us win the conference championship. We had an 11-point lead with about 16 minutes to go, but uh, the second half we were 7 of 25 from the floor. We shot 28%, and we just uh, we had good shots. They just didn't fall. And instead of getting frustrated, we just, during our timeouts, reminded the kids just to keep executing, and uh, we'll go down the stretch and give it the best shot we can. And when you think about it, this group of kids now, and I'm not saying this because I'm their coach, but I, think, I don't think sometimes we appreciate uh, what they just accomplished. At one time, we were 5-3 and three in the conference, and three-way tie for fifth. We won 10 straight conference games. In fact, we won our last seven games of the year and 11 of our last 12. And our, the, the f thing I'm proud about is the fact that we won 10 consecutive conference games in the number one ranked NCAA Division II Conference of the Nation, according to Basketball Times. When you think about it, uh, that's a conference record, 10 consecutive conference wins like that. They end up 15 and three we won the conference outright because Kentucky Wesleyan pounded Southern Indiana 83-66 in their last game. We won the conference outright, 23 and 4. That's a school record for most victories. Obviously, 21 being the, the school record we set twice in the last three years. Uh, the 23 and 4 is the best record in the region. We were able to get the number one seed in the region, and we did get the automatic bid, obviously, from our conference. But there are only eight number one seeds in the entire country. And I looked at the uh, teams that got in, 
there's only 32 that get in, and there were, I think, seven or eight schools with better records in the whole country. In the whole country. And we play probably the toughest schedule you know, our, our, with our league than most of them. So uh, I'm proud of the fact that we're with the elite now. We've proven it over a four-year, four-month period, I mean, that uh, we are the best in the Great Lakes region in the five-state area here in consideration for, obviously, we're top ten in the United States. But there's not another national poll that comes out, but we were 14th in the last poll before going into this week. And, and to win two games on the road at Northern Kentucky Thursday, we won by 17, 87, 70, and they had just lost by one to Wesleyan, and, or to Southern Indiana, and almost beat Wesleyan. So. I mean, they, we could just got tough kids that just came through. Did you get a little feeling of uh, some deja vu there toward the end of that Indianapolis game? Uh, last year, you guys went into the game, last game of the year on the road, uh, tied for the for the league uh, lead. You went, uh, you lost the game 62-60. Uh, Sean took a shot last second. Uh, <laughs> apparently, a little bit of contact, but no foul. Mm -hmm. uh, missed the shot. You guys lost, didn't go to the tournament this year. You win 62-60, you went into the game on the road, tied for the league title. Sean takes the last shot uh, this year, goes in. I think a little bit of justice there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's justice for Sean. That's a senior coming through in the clutch. Um, yeah, ex ironically, it's the same exact score. The Indianapolis kids played very well. They played very hard. We played hard. Uh, we just didn't convert very well offensively. Uh, they shot 62% the second half. We shot 28% and we win. Uh, you go figure that out. Uh, if I told you that, uh, you wouldn't believe that we won. And 62, you know, uh, that's a very low scoring for us. We're averaging almost 90 points a game, but exactly, it was the exact same score, 62-60, except we won this year. But uh, I'm just happy for the seniors. They're very deserving of that. They uh, they won 20 games as freshmen when they came in with, you know, but we had other talented seniors in. They won 16 as a sophomore, when they were sophomores. And they beat the number one and number three team in the nation in February that year. As juniors last year, 21-7, and seven, came within one ball possession of winning the conference championship and going to the NCAA tournament. And this year, uh, they got it all. They got that last ball. It was a dramatic finish. I mean, it what might have not been the prettiest basketball game to watch in terms of not converting. But we only had, I think, nine turnovers for the game, so it wasn't like it was a sloppy game or anything. It was just a very, very intense game where every ball possession was uh, so important. And to have them win it on a last second shot on a putback, and who else but your All-American Sean Gibson, an offensive rebound, which is his specialty, and there was three guys around him, and he falls down on his rear end at the free throw line, and the ball still hasn't gone in yet, and bounces around and goes in. I mean, it's just, it's justice for those kids. I mean, they'll remember that forever, and uh, to win the conference championship outright, that's only the second GLVC conference that any team won here. I think women's volleyball is the only one that's, that's won a conference, GLVC mm -hmm. conference title here. And uh, to get the number one seed in the NCAA tournament is, is uh, just a dream come true for these kids. Is the, uh, the, the poor shooting in the game against Indianapolis, that's something that concerns you? Because I was uh, just looking at the, some of the stats the other day. I think four times in the last nine games, you guys have shot under 50%. And you're like 53, 54% most of the year. Yeah. Is that well, anything that concerns you going One game was 49%, and we just had a horrible first half. Uh, no, because... Like senior night, we shot 49%, and we were just awful the first half. We, were, we started out 1 of 12 on the floor. That was just adrenaline. The kids were hyper. They were, no, uh, the only thing that would concern me is if we took bad shots or the kids that normally take shots from different areas were not taking them from that area, and that would be execution of offense. Against Indianapolis, Indianapolis, the University of Indianapolis lost to Ashland on Thursday. And ironically, the Saturday before, beat Kentucky Wesleyan at Kentucky Wesleyan. And it was their night of champions. They brought back all their, all their national champion uh, players. And they beat them at Owensboro, the sports center, which is a big accomplishment, uh, something we've never done. And uh, so they were riding a high, University of Indianapolis players, and they only lost to Southern Indiana in overtime at, in, at Southern Indiana. So they were playing very well. And then to lose it to Ashland, they, just, they were flat. They gave a uh, poor performance. And they were motivated in the fact that, you know, they were 13-13. and 13. It was the last game of the year. They were home. It was senior night for them now. And it was, it was, if they beat us, it's like a feather in their cap. They have a winning season. They go off on a high note. They had everything, you know, to shoot for that way. They didn't have the pressures of a conference title on the line. But we didn't play scared. We played hard, and we executed very well, and we just didn't convert. I mean, we missed chip shots inside and wide-open jump shots. Shane Gibson was 2 of 10. And he wasn't forcing shots. Uh, Andrew Lieber was one of six. So my two starting wings 
well, three of 16. I mean, that's that's a tough night for our kids inside. And Sean Gibson was bodied a lot and triple, doubled and triple teamed. So, uh, John Hostrad played. Uh, you know, he had to play 10 minutes and inside, and he's back from that ankle injury. So it's a. It wasn't a situation where I was worried about the poor shooting because we made our free throws down the stretch, and usually we're the other way around. We shoot well from the floor and are horrendous from the free throw line during stretches. But down the down the at the end, there I think we were eight of nine down the stretch. So um, being tied like that, the kids just executed at the end. Uh, we didn't get the shot we wanted off the set play, but Andre didn't have enough time to wait for the um, the third option, so he's supposed to take it himself. And I had another timeout in case. The ball we got kicked out, or in case we got trapped, we would have called a timeout, ran a special from the side. But overtime wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world because of the fact that uh, we were not in foul trouble and uh, we had timeouts left, and we would have been okay. Why, and why did you not call the timeout right away? And a lot of times, uh, the teams right when they get the rebound to call that timeout, set up a play. Well, on the floor at that time, we had uh, four seniors and a junior, and they knew exactly we were going to run. And if you call a timeout, now you got to worry about getting the ball in bounds. So if I have no timeouts left now, and we don't get the ball in bounds, or Indianapolis tips it away, or there's a loose ball, the clock's going to run. And we only had seven seconds when we went for the shot. So there was no, you know, we had called two previous timeouts to that, so they knew exactly what we were going to run. We are going to run our Purdue set if he made one, and we are down one. And we are going to run our delay game to game winner if it was tied. And so they knew exactly what they were going to do. And with a senior point guard, you know, he knows what to do. Scott Simmons, I wish he would have went back to the right to Andre, instead of going to the left to Shane, but you know, he went where the defense forced him and, and uh, Andre ran it. Uh, Scott set the up his screen for, for uh, Sean Gibson, but there was three guys in the lane packing it in. Andre didn't wait for the double stagger for Shane, and it wouldn't have been there anyway. And Andre had, had the kid, so he took him down. He had a 10-foot jump shot, and he was one of five before he took that. So I, I give Andre a lot of credit in the fact that it takes guts to be the hero at the end like that. Uh, he wouldn't have been the GOAT if he missed it because it would have went overtime, but to try to be the hero, and he took it. And fortunately, because we set the pick and they switched on Sean, they forgot to block out Sean, so it worked out okay. A little bit of luck involved, but it would take luck too. I mean, we had to be you know, a little bit lucky uh, to win the conference title. It takes talented players and organization and skill and things like that, but a little luck never hurts. Okay, we'll uh, come back in a minute. We'll take a look at uh, the pairings and the, uh, the sites for this weekend's tournament. After dating the guy forever, you think I could tell him anything. Why is this so hard? I'm really scared. It takes a lot of guts to tell someone he's too drunk to drive. But you can do it. Just say it. Because if you don't, there may be nothing left to say. Kevin, I'm going to drive. Take the keys, call a cab, take a stand. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. is just one of the many parts you can play as a young Red Cross volunteer. Volunteer and play your part. Oh, welcome back to the Andy Piazza Show. Now, uh, Sunday when the NCAA announced the bids, uh, the only, uh, you knew you were getting in, there was, there was no drama there, you just were waiting to see whether or not you were, where, where you're going to be playing, uh, hoping that it would be in Fort Wayne, but uh, you got the word that it was going to be in uh, Evansville. Uh, what, what was your reaction when well, you found that? Well, first that of all, it, it was nice, the uh, amount of people here. I think we had almost 70 people showed up for a press conference uh, at the Gate Sports Center there in the Royal Don's room, and uh, the satellite dish was where the pairings came off of, so we had it all hooked up here. and. We felt after I, that morning, after I heard that Wesleyan beat Southern Indiana, there was no uh, the obvious choice is to have us the number one seed, and the recommendations usually are that the number one seeds get to host the regionals. And I know uh, on the committee, one person in particular stated that 
regardless of money or anything else, that the number one seed should get to host it because they've worked for four months to be the best record in the region, and they are the automatic bid, the conference champions, that they should host it. And if you look at it, if you're on the outside in looking at it, you're not involved with any of the schools or anything like that, we have Northern Michigan coming from way up in the Upper Peninsula, as far away as you can go. Wayne State and Detroit, us, Southern Indiana and Evansville. We all have to go down to Evansville. If you look at it, it doesn't make any sense because if it was in Fort Wayne here, we have as nice a facility, beautiful town, hotels, restaurants, things to do. People in Wayne State are three hours away maximum. Evansville people are five hours away. Northern Michigan, eight, nine, ten, eleven hours, but they can get here in a day driving. Uh, plenty of hotel space. We had everything all set up for him. Uh, Dan Gebhardt, our assistant athletic director, did a tremendous job putting together the whole package. He was organized, everything ready to go. The bottom line it came to, ironically, was money. And that's what they stated. Um, it was asked, there was a question and answer period after uh, the pairings were announced in the sites. And the question came from, ironically, a member of the newspaper down in Evansville. His question was, why didn't Kentucky Wesleyan get in? And why didn't Fort Wayne host it? Well, first of all, Kentucky Wesleyan beat Southern Indiana by 17 last game of the year. They ended up third place in our conference, 13 and 5 record, 21 and 6 overall. St. Joe's also was. 13-5 in the conference and 21-6 overall. So we have our two third-place winners, both 21-6, do not get a bid. That's how tough it was. To explain a little bit, going back a little bit, Wayne State did get in because they won their conference tournament up there. There were 17-9 going to the conference tournament. You see it happening Division One right now. You have teams that are, uh, Wayne State was tied, a three-way tie for third place in a regular season. They win their conference tournament. They're 19-9, but they have to be playing well to beat Northern Michigan at Northern because Northern was a site of uh, the conference tournament. Northern Michigan gets in because they're ranked 19th in the nation last Tuesday, and they won the conference championship regular season, which is not an automatic bid, but gives them some strength there. And they were third in the region uh, going into uh, this weekend. So I could see why they took the two teams from Michigan because who are you going to decide between St. Joe and Wesleyan, both 21 and 6? So they decided, well, we'll go with the two from Michigan and two from uh, the Great Lakes Valley Conference and call it quits and just hear the complaining. Well, anyway, Al Shields, the tournament director, uh, stated flat out that his statement was almost quote for quote was University of Southern Indiana's budget proposal was substantially larger than all other bids that were put in which means they bought the tournament. They had to have bid thousands and thousands of dollars more than us because they're bringing in all these teams, they're flying in these teams plus they're you know guaranteeing so much money to the NCAA and we put together a pretty nice bid. Uh, it was over the minimum um, it was enough that we should have been considered. And I was told by one of the committee members that if we were within three, four, five thousand dollars of if somebody was that much higher than us, being the number one seed, we'd still get it. So they must have been like tens of thousands of dollars more than us, which is ridiculous in a way. I mean, it'd be like this, uh, you know, I telling our players that if a twelve say, take two twelve year old little boys and one works and mows lawns and washes cars and paints houses and when he's 16 years old, he buys an old beat-up Chevrolet. And he nurtures it and washes the wax and parks it, makes sure he doesn't get any dings or scratches on it. He really appreciates that car because he worked to get it. He worked four years to get it. We worked four months to be the number one seat. And then you get another 12-year-old boy who at 16 years of age, his daddy just goes out and buys him a brand new Cadillac. Do you think he appreciates that? Now, is that fair? Well. Life's not fair, but he, you know, because his father can afford to buy a brand new car. I'm not saying that, that kid's a bad kid, but he didn't have to work for it, and he might not take care of that car as well. I hope our kids just appreciate the four months they put in, that they're blue-collar workers, and they, they receive the number one ranking, and maybe they learn a lesson in life that uh, life isn't always fair, and sometimes a person with more power or more money is going to be able to get to an, a situation like this. But... Buying the regional just because you're hosting doesn't guarantee you're going to win it. And they got to get by Northern Michigan, and we got to get by Wayne State if we're to meet in the finals. And I think it's going to give some added incentive to our kids the fact that, uh, you know, the wealthy people down south, you know, bought the tournament doesn't mean they're going to buy the trophy. Were you surprised? I know the NCAA tends to, <coughs> whenever anybody asks what the criteria are for, for hosting a regional league, I don't know, most of the time people kind of throw in the money issue. They'll list things like the hotels, uh, accessibility by air, by uh, travel, things like that. Were you surprised that the first words out of, out of the uh, uh, chairman's mouth was 
the budget? Money. I was surprised, but I'm glad he said it because if he would have sidestepped around it, you know, then it would have been um, us crying sour grapes, you know, a little bit the fact that they bought it, which really was an issue, but it was the issue. And ironically, they, we were told that the money factor was not going to be an overriding issue because the NCA has these TV contracts now that we don't need the money to pay expenses. Um, so it wasn't going to be the overriding issue. And they could talk about Southern Indiana having better attendance than we do. Well, they do have better attendance than we do, but they have a different market there. They only have University of Evansville in town. They don't have a market like we do in Fort Wayne. But when you come to tournament time, we'd sell our place out because our fans would be there. All the fans that are hiding behind, you know, that are, are interested would be there. Fans that never been there before are going to see what we're all about. Plus, all three of those schools will bring, you know, three, four hundred people each down. Now, how many people from northern Michigan or Wayne State are going to go down to Evansville to see it play? Hey, it's funny in a way, but it's more of a tournament atmosphere for our program and our players to go somewhere and play, though, too. I mean, there's an advantage of playing home, but there's a disadvantage in that. It's like... It's another game. Is it really an NCAA tournament? Well, here, you know, we're going on the road and playing it. And we don't have to play Southern Indiana the first game. We've got to play Wayne State. So we have to get over the fact that we're not hosting it right now. And we took yesterday off practice. And uh, today we're just going to concentrate on getting ready for Wayne State. We have films. Uh, my assistant coach already has two films on Wayne State. We're breaking down those films. And we just have to prepare for Friday's game. And you know what's ironic? We're playing at Southern Indiana at their gym. And we're playing the second game, and we're wearing white uniforms because we're the number one seed. So Southern Indiana's playing the preliminary game. And uh, I don't know. There's a, we split with them the regular season. We lost at their place, but uh, that was after that Kentucky Weston loss. So uh, I don't know. We go with the philosophy. We'll play anybody, anywhere, anytime. And if they want to put two portable goals up in the parking lot and bring in Southern <laughs> Indiana, we'll play them right now. It's, our kids are got that kind of mentality right now. Nivia, I know you said you're, you're looking at some films with Wayne State and uh, Northern Michigan. You, you have s if a couple of common opponents uh, with Wayne State. I know you both played Findlay, both played Hillsdale. Uh, those are the two films we have, too. <laughs> those are the two films you have. Uh -huh. uh, you been able to learn anything about Wayne State, about their style? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. We don't have the film of Hillsdale Wayne State. We have oh. a film of uh, uh, Wayne State and um, Findlay and uh, Wayne State and Ashland. That's who we have. They mm -hmm. played Ashland earlier right. in the year. And we did play Hillsdale, yes. Um, Style-wise, they have a big kid in the middle, 6'9 kid. They bring in two 6'7", six, 6'8 kids off the bench. Uh, they have a 6'3 shooter in the wing, Armstrong. Their point gu or their off guard um, is Danny Lewis is very, very good. Danny Lewis is 6'2", averages 21 points a game. Senior was runner-up for player of the year in the conference up in Michigan. Very good player. Point guard, Mark Haran is a steady point guard, 6 foot. Um, uh, William Page from Mott from, uh, Junior College in Flint is a very good player. 6'6", 215, great offensive rebounder. Went Division One out of Junior College, but then something happened uh, academically, and he bounced out of there, and he ended up at Wayne State. Uh, they'll go nine deep. Um, they averaged 83 points a game this year, and that's a school record for most points. So they're not a running up and down team necessarily, but they do score a lot in transition. Uh, they press. They put a man on the ball of bounds. They diamond press. They'll trap the first pass in bounds. They'll go back play man to man, predominantly man to man back. But they'll trap when the ball's taken out of bounds on the baseline, the end line, after made field goals, after made free throws, after turnovers, and they'll trap a lot of pressure on you defensively like that. Uh, they run two guys inside. They post up the big kid inside, and uh, they do a lot of screening away. And they try to free up uh, Danny Lewis a lot for perimeter jump shots. They'll take threes. Um, they're a different team in that uh, they're more athletic than uh, Northern Michigan. If you're comparing the two, Northern Michigan is younger, and they're more of a three-point shooting team. They take a lot of threes. So um, it's going to be a different kind of game. Uh, we match up okay with them. Uh, they have some athletes that got like Kentucky State, but uh, we do a pretty good job matching up with them. If we execute our offense, uh, make them chase us around for a while, we'll be in pretty good shape. We have an advantage in that. Being the first seed, uh, we get we got to choose which hotel we're going to stay at down there. So we're staying at the Executive Inn, where uh, where we um, stayed every year when we go down there and play. We get the choice practice time on Thursday. Uh, we get the choice shoot around time on Friday. So uh, those things are advantage. Our kids are going to sleep in the same hotel, eat in the same restaurant, and play the same gym that they have 
down in Evansville for the last four years for those seniors. So there's a little bit of advantage there compared to Wayne State. Wayne State has to fly to Louisville. They can't even get into Evansville. See, which is really nonsense the way that they gave it. To, this is another problem that you come into. Uh, there's no way to get to Evansville. There's no expressway there. There's no highway. You know, <laughs> and the airport's not like, very accommodating, and it's small, and it uh, doesn't have very many air, air uh, lines there. Uh, Wayne State out uh, Detroit has to fly to Louisville and then bus over to Evansville. Uh, we're not going down Wednesday. We're going Thursday morning because there's no sense in going down there and sitting around for two days thinking about the tournament. So we're just going to go down Thursday morning. It's a normal routine for us. We practice late afternoon and go back to the hotel and the banquets that night and sleep in the next day and shoot around and then we play that night. So it's a normal routine that we do when we go on the road in conference versus practicing Wednesday and going down there Wednesday, sit in the hotel room you know, Wednesday night and then all day Thursday. It doesn't make any sense. So we want them to sleep in their own beds Wednesday and keep in the same routine as possible. And fortunately, we're on spring break this week, so kids don't have time just to relax a little bit and not worry about academics and get ready for practice every day. So it's a good situation for us. And I hope we have a lot of people go down. Uh, Dan Gebhardt has tickets for sale uh, over in the Gates Sports Center. Just call the Gates Sports Center, the athletic department, and uh, I think you have to buy them by Wednesday night. I'm not sure. I think so. You might know. I think yeah, because so. we're going on Thursday. Mm -hmm. I think he has 250 allotment uh, right now. We can get more, I think. Uh, but uh, he's first person who walked in uh, Monday morning uh, bought 20 tickets <laughs> at uh, 16 bucks each for the two-day session. So, I mean, we're going to have we're going to have some fans there. Okay, I'd like to remind everyone the tournament will be uh, this Friday and Saturday down in Evansville. Uh, tickets will be available through IPFW uh, through Wednesday night. Uh, after that, the tickets, uh, you'll have to purchase them at the door uh, in Evansville. They're $16 for a two-day pass uh, for, for uh, chair back seats, $12 for bleacher seats. Uh, single, single game tickets go for $8 and $6.